This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where we talk about what it's like to be a Christian Monday through Saturday, to live as a person of faith in a culture against faith. What's going on? Not much, man. I'm feeling good. Found this awesome hat today. Oh yeah, it's a it's a cool hat. Yeah, man. It's a I cool hat. I don't know what company is. Stuart and Stevenson. If you know, let us know. Yeah, be but it is a super like retro hat. I'm sure it's like twenty something years old. Looks like it's made by Cosas Activewear. But yeah, just found it in the closet today randomly. It was like, oh yeah, man, that rocks. Yeah, it's super cool. Yeah, highlight of my day right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I actually decided to like get. Looking nice today. Put on a, a button down and a sweater because it's cold. And it was not. It was like eighty today. It was cold this morning. It was like forty six oh, this morning. When I was. I, I was wondering why you were looking. Yeah. Like. Somewhere like a f- preppy boy, but uh-huh. it was forty six this morning, um, and it's cold out there right now. Um, well, yeah, but it's dark. <laughs> I was outside in sweatpants earlier today playing with the kids, sweating my behind off. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I actually decided to, like, do something with myself today. If you don't know me, listener, yep. um, before coronavirus and quarantine and not going places, I actually, I was always dressed to the nines. I always looked good. What does that mean, dressed to the nines? I don't know. <laughs> Um, but I was always looking good. Fashion was like my thing. And then quarantine happened and it was sweatpants for me every day. And you were lucky if I shaved. (laughs) (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. I feel that 100%. Yeah. Um, I didn't care about fashion near as much as Clayton. I still don't. I don't spend money on clothes. Like I don't spend money on clothes anymore, but yeah, because your butt spent way too much money in a past life, which is why I don't have to spend money now. Yeah. Well, I never spend money on clothes. I probably should, but Hunter's always telling me, Hunter's my wife. If anyone doesn't know, she's always telling me, well, like the way you look at your brand and I'm like, yeah, my brand is pragmatic. (laughs) (laughs) My brand is cheap. (laughs) Oh my God. So I don't spend money on clothes. I just, I would rather spend my money on things that make money rather than lose money. But that's just me. That's why it's the highlight of my day. You spend money on golf. How does golf make you money? They're skins games. (laughs) What, what you, what you doing, bro? (laughs) Okay, Colin. Uh, It also... And this this is just very pragmatic. Golf's the sport of a rich man. As a fundraiser, you got to be good at golf. <laughs> People Fair of enough. means play golf. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. That's right. I could argue with that wall over there and win. I promise. <laughs> if you if if you're not watching this on YouTube, I just rolled my eyes bigger than I have in years. <laughs> The sad part is Clayton could argue with that wall and think that he wins. <laughs> he just rolls his eyes again. Anyways. We're continuing the <laughs> discussion about family. Yep. Um, four minutes in. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because you guys just got a little bit of an input on mine and Cullen's day in, day out kind of conversations um, yep. Yep. as brothers. Yeah. So if you didn't know, we're brothers. Uh, I'm six year six years older than six you? years. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't even know how old I am, y'all. That's not true. You're 21. Yeah, but you just had to ask me. Obviously, you know how old you are. And you just I forget <laughs> how old I am a lot of the time. Somebody asked me the other day, "How old are you?" And I was like, "Uh, wait, what? Uh, 27. Oh yeah, 27. <laughs> yeah, I forget oftentimes. And then the other day, Hunter asked me how old she was, and I was like, "Dude, I can't even keep track of my own age. How am I supposed <laughs> to keep track of yours?" <laughs> I'm doing good to remember the day you were born. Oh my gosh! Oh goodness! So we're co- we're continuing our conversation about family. Yep. Last week we talked about should we represent the biblical model of family, um, 
And this week we're talking about kind of what does the gospel speak into that? Yeah. So if you've joined us for all three of these episodes, the first one was like kind of what is the biblical model of family? Right. And if you haven't listened to it, definitely go back because I'm yeah. just going to give a brief over here, overview here. But it's very authority-driven, patriarchal, oppressive kind of model. Yeah, domineering. Yeah, almost. which is not really healthy for anyone. No. And, uh, well, but, maybe if you're at the top of the pyramid. Well, even it's not, then healthy, it's not healthy, but it may be more palatable. Yeah. Um. So then and the second week... We talked about how it's not healthy. Yeah, and both from an overall theological and care of a person perspective on my end, it's mm. unhealthy, but also from Clayton as a social work student who has statistics with adolescent development and society at large and how their family models work, it was equally, if not more, determiningly unhealthy. Yeah. If you're not careful, that model um, can be detrimental to your kids. Um, yeah. You have to be really careful um, because if you, if you end up in this domineering um, uh, uh, authoritarian position, uh, you can really kind of scare the crap out of your kids. Well, and not just long that. term, that has hardcore effects. Yeah, well, not just scare scare them, but, you know, we talk about trauma. Mm -hmm. And trauma is anyone that causes someone emotional overload. Yeah. Um, so for some people, you know, tra well, let me, re let me rephrase this. Gone are the days that trauma can be chalked up to like, traumatic stress. Yeah, like being a war vet. Yeah. A divorce can be traumatic for someone. Yeah. If you're a party to that case or if you're a, a child in that case. I, I, and I think that when we talk about trauma, I think it's really important um, to, to define it in a way that makes sure that it is totally subjective. Yes, um, absolutely, because someone else can experience what is traumatic to them that you may think it's minimal. I had a, a, th a therapist one time. Yes, I, I had a therapist. I'm not it's perfect. okay to have Jesus and a therapist too. Yeah. Um, I had a therapist one time, and one of his assessments, uh, he asked me to write up um, my five most traumatic experiences. Okay. And in that... Um, I wrote them all down and I kind of thought to myself, would you have considered them all trauma outside of that exercise? Probably not. And that's where I was going. Okay. They, sorry. Like if this was someone else, one of them, maybe one of them, maybe, um, but outside of like, if, if it was somebody else telling me these stories, I would have a hard time not thinking like, dude, that's not traumatic. Calm down. You're fine. Yeah. You're fine. But, in evaluating my life, those are the most traumatic things that have happened to me. Yeah. And then I started thinking, maybe trauma really is individual for the person. Well, it has to be because trauma is framed around the individual, mm. and each individual has a different worldview. Yeah. They have a different background. They come from a different place in society. And so the same exact thing can happen to two different people and one think it's nothing at all. Right. And the other one think it's detrimental. Yeah. A great example of this is in my own children. Mm. I have two kids. If you don't know, they are 10 months apart. Yeah. They are not twins, but they are 10 months apart. And so I have a really good read on this. Um, because they're functionally twins. My son, who's the younger one, is every bit as big and some days bigger than my other one, my daughter. And so they're right there together. They do everything together. They've never spent a day apart from one another. Yeah. And I mean, when they well, when and when they once, are apart, 
um, they're always asking for the other one. They're yep. super close. Yep. So once my son was born, they never spent a day apart from one another. And so going, going with that, I can do one thing to my daughter. And if I do that exact same thing to my son, at least he responds like it's traumatic. <laughs> yeah. It may not be trauma in the way that we're talking about it, but my daughter, it can be literally nothing. Yeah. She's like, uh, whatever, daddy. Mm. My son, it's like, it's, it's the, the end, end of the of world. world. Yeah. yeah. And so trauma does need to be subjective. It, well, we need to talk about it like it's subjective for sure. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, all, I also would argue that I think it is subjective in general. I don't oh, even no, think that is. the conversation around it should be subjective. I know, uh, like, I, it is. But the problem here is that we don't talk about it like it's subjective. Trauma is we've subjective. Given it, we've given it a definition that fits in a box. Right. Um, yeah. Trauma is subjective whether or not we talk about it as subjective or not, right? It doesn't matter. Yeah. The conversation needs to be had, though, that your individual trauma, which, if you know anything about mental health and if you know anything about therapy, lots of times it comes from your family and how you were raised. I think statistically, I feel pretty confident confident saying that it comes from, it's rooted in some form of familial relationship. Yeah, lots of times it is. Um, lots of times it is. Whether that, I mean, because that can come, I mean, even if you find yourself in an abusive, intimate relationship, yeah. you found that other partner, presumably yeah. in some kind of reaction to the intimate relationships that you saw modeled when you were a child. Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of this, your family is your primary form of socialization. Yes. They teach you how to live. Yep. Um, and so you look for partners that match your family model. You do things that you think you're generally speaking, you do things that you think that your family would appreciate. Um, not always. Right. I, yeah. I, that needs to be. Yeah. So it's not, but, it's, it's not a, uh, it's not an exclusive. Right. Um, it's not an absolute, but. I know about this through family systems theory um, and family systems theory says that the family is a system and you learn how to act based upon how your system functions. Yeah. And so that's socialization in and of itself. Yeah. Well, there's a bit of a difference we can talk about that's a nuance, but in that when you learn how to act within the system, if you've ever given yourself a construct of that system, you know your role in that system. Right. And so you find people that can then fit in that system again. And if you've ever seen, as much as we as American society at large might make fun of this, if you've ever seen those instances where two people are grown and one of them takes on the quote unquote role of an infant in the intimate relationship and the other one is the caregiver. Mm -hmm. While we might laugh at that and like make fun of that, that's saying something about family systems theory. Yeah. That was traumatic. Like their experience of that was traumatic to them and they now function in an unhealthy way because yeah. their system was dysfunctional to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you really have to, to be extremely careful um, with, with how you raise your family, how you raise your kids. Um, you can't have this domineering authoritarian um, model. Well, you, 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 you can, but it will lead to an unhealthy experience. Right. That, that's kind of obvious. And Yeah, in I would I'm, hope so. But yeah. <laughs> sometimes, man, I learned this a long time ago in, in communication classes in seminary. When you get tired of saying it, people are just now hearing it. <laughs> so Okay. I try, so I you try can to do be, this, yeah. but it doesn't work. Right. Don't do it. 
maybe that's the way we need to word this is don't do it. Yeah, it it is a very, very bad idea in 99% of cases to take that role. Yes. Um, um, and if you go back and listen to the previous episode, we talked about the authoritative model, right? Which is yeah. the the blend of the the passive and the authoritarian, which is there is structure, but you allow for freedom of thinking. And, and I think like, that's the gospel. Yeah. So for me, this episode is titled... You know, how should the gospel impact or affect our uh, family units? It should be that exact thing that you just said. Absolutely. The gospel is defined in that God, quote unquote, the father loved the world so much that he sacrificed. He gave his only son. For the redemption of everyone else. Yeah. Now, yet, there was a structure within that, right? There, There's a minimum, there's like a, an external boundary. You got to believe that Jesus is Lord, right? Confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. There's a structure yeah. there. And there's even a structure of how someone should act, loving justice, loving mercy, acting in humility, like all of these things. Yeah. There's a structure there being hospitable of which exists, but above all, it's love and sacrifice. And I talk about this a lot. It, so if you don't know, my first love is like preaching and communication. And so and I'm really bad about this. Don't Don't hate me. Um, church, but like, I don't study preachers. I think preachers by and large, and I'm, I know I'm talking about my own hood and I get that and I'm sorry, but honest to God, I don't think most preachers in America would pass college level speech. No, we are just terrible communicators Yeah, because in seminary, you're taught how to create the content that you're going to deliver. Yeah. You're never taught how to deliver it. Yeah. So that's got to be external learning that you do, which we just know people are not good at. Yeah. People don't do external learning very well. And so you I You learn just enough to get there. Yep. And so I think we do a poor job of teaching communicators. And so I don't study other preachers. Right. Um, I study comedians because, and hear me on this, comedians are the only people on the planet that can hold 100% of the attention in the room 100% of the time. Absolutely. When have you ever tuned out watching a comedy special? Oh, a comedy special? I don't know, because you could pretty easily get distracted by other things. But if you were at a comedy show, never. So, like, let's just tell the story real quick about when we went to go see Dave Chappelle in Pasadena. Yeah, so roast me in the comments. I don't care. Dave Chappelle, goat of comedy. 100%. Do not care. He is, I would argue that he is the greatest communicator, not just comedian, but greatest communicator of our generation, like that mm-hmm. our generation has ever experienced. This mm-hmm. guy is incredible. And and so when we went to go see him, there were what, two or three people that went to go that like open for him? There was Pete Davidson. Yeah, Pete Davidson was there. There was someone before Pete, and then there was someone before him too. Um, yeah, there were like three or four acts before Dave. They were good. Like, I, I'm a fan of Pete Davidson. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, but Pete just doesn't hold my attention as well as Dave does. Oh, Dave is another level. Um, but the entire time we were in that room, did we ever, like, fully just turn off? Only when I went to go get beer. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I, I mean, exactly. And that's because I left the room. Yeah. Right? I mean, but but here's my point in saying all that. Communicator or comedians are some of the best communicators because good humor is always grounded in some element of truth. Yeah. And so people, as you're flipping through TikTok and you're finding yourself laughing, it's because good humor is always grounded in some element of truth. Yeah. So I was flipping through, I don't have TikTok, but 
I'm loving what Instagram is doing with the reels. Oh yeah. Um, and so I was flipping through the reels earlier today and I saw this one where it was a girl and she looked 18, 19 years old kind of thing. And the words on the screen is her face. And the words on the screen were, um, I can't believe my parents thought that I would stay here after I graduated, after they emotionally abused me my entire life. Oh, I think I saw that. And it, and then she's like kind of laughing or whatever. And it's like, and, you know, I found myself snickering at it at first because, like, I think that resonates with a whole lot of people. Yeah. But it's not funny. But that's the deal. It's not funny. It is. But the, oh. re- but the reason we laughed is because it's grounded in an element of truth. Yeah. There are so many people that feel that way, that they were emotionally abused by their parents. And let me tell you, emotional abuse can come in the form of helicopter parenting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, not letting your kids go out, um, not letting them express themselves with their friends. Um, that can be a form of emotional abuse. Sheltering. Well, and it can be a form of emotional abuse to shelter someone to the extent that that it hinders their development. Yeah. If... You know, and once again, I talk about it all the time, but I love the Liturgist podcast. Yeah. And Hillary on there, she talks about, so Hillary's a therapist, psychologist, uh, you know, just working on her PhD, got her PhD. I don't know. She's amazing. She's got her PhD. Um, written like several books. She says all the time, if you still think the way that you do at 28 as you did at eight. Yeah. You stunted your development. Like that's unhealthy development that you, that you still believe exactly that way. Yeah. And, and so if, if we shelter people into a box that way, we're not doing anyone's service. Family should be the place that's safe to express yourself. That's, unique to you being the one place that you can be yourself yeah. and not have to put a front on for anyone everywhere we go in this world we got to put up a front yeah. you try to get a job you got to put up a front you go to class you got to put up a front if you go to private school that's even worse because you got to wear a uniform some public schools you got to wear a uniform yeah. when you go to college you got to try to fit in when you make it out in the real world with friends you got to try to conform to what they're looking for yeah i mean everywhere we go we got to put up a front your family is the one place that you shouldn't have to do that. That you, yeah, that you shouldn't have to do that. And yet, I fear that more times than not, we end up feeling like the family is the place we have to put up a front if we go according to the biblical model. Yeah. Because it can really, really lend itself to a bad spot where I got to put up a front because it, honestly, and this this may be crude oversimplification. If it is, let me know in the comments and we can talk about it. But for me, when I read the biblical model, everyone in that model has to conform to the patriarch. Yeah. It, like you got to put up a front to be whoever the patriarch wants you to be. Yeah. And if not, quote unquote, and I know I'm going to be stepping on some toes here, you're not honoring your father and mother. Your yeah. father can require some things of you that we know mentally, psychologically, emotionally, that are extremely unhealthy. But if you don't do them, you're quote unquote, not honoring your father and mother. Yeah. And, and so there is something to honoring your father and mother, you know, children that are listening, right? Absolutely. You should respect your parents 100%. But parents don't be domineering. Don't ask them to do things that, one, you wouldn't do yourself, first of all. Second of all, don't, like, try to hinder them. Don't, like, put them in a box. Let them be themselves. We, I think we see this most often in dads who once were great athletes. Oh, yeah. Good one. But it's not limited to that. Anytime you try to vicariously live through your kid, yeah. 
you're imposing something upon them that's unhealthy because you may be asking them to be someone that you're not. I know that there's this great story I know, and I'm not going to use names because I haven't had permission to tell this story. But I know a man who just wanted to connect with his son. And so he did the thing that he would like to do when he would have been his son's age. He want he always wanted to play like catch baseball catch with his dad, and so when he became a dad and his son got you know eight nine ten, they would go outside and they'd play catch, and he's just trying to connect with his son, and so he would do it and like they'd do it and do it and do it and they did it every day you know through the spring and summer and fall and kept doing it and kept doing it through several years and finally, one day. They've been playing catch for, you know, an hour or so. Excuse me. And the son says, Dad, have you had enough yet? Mm. And the dad goes, yeah, we can go in if you want to. And the son goes, yeah, that'd be good. They go inside and the dad stopped and he told his wife what happened and said, I'm not going to ask him if he wants to play catch anymore. Let's see what happens. Never once did he ever ask to play again. He was absentmindedly in good intentions, vicariously living through his son what he would have wanted rather than giving his son the ability, like we're talking about, to say, hey, here's what I'd like to do. Hey, Dad, here's what I need from you. Yeah. I don't I don't need to be the person you need me to be. I need you to ask me what I need from you. Yeah. Um the first step I think in in this scenario is just sitting down and having a conversation. Like being real and being honest. I don't think that our relationship is where it needs to be. I would like to foster that. Or I would I want to get closer to you. What is something that you and I could do together? Yeah, that could grow that relationship. What do you want to do? And, and kids, that goes with your parents too. Like if you're in college or you're out of college and you're not living at home anymore and you don't feel close to your parents, that goes the other direction. Yeah, if relationships are truly two sided, then integration happens both ways yeah you just need to like if they're because i know that this is a common situation and it makes me sad but you know guys if you don't feel close enough with your dad maybe it's time you sit him down and if he's a beer drinker and you're a beer drinker sit him down with a beer and say hey dad what's something that you and i could do together it would help us grow closer to each other. Yeah. And I know it's hard because like, I just think about our dad. We don't have any of the same hobbies. Uh, other than smoking pipes. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and like, I mean, I like smoking pipes, but I don't know that I want to do it for three or four hours consecutively. Oh, well, he doesn't want to do it for three or four hours consecutively. I know. So yeah. outside of that, like, we don't really have anything in common. We used to. Yeah. But, so if you don't know, I'm an Enneagram 3. And Enneagrams 3s try to conform mm. to who they need to be. And so I think a lot of the things I did, I did in order to connect with my dad. And so as I kind of grew out of that, a lot of the hobbies that my dad has, I don't have anymore. And so we don't really have those. And so this is where I say that the gospel should inform these conversations because it's about sacrifice. Right. You may not have, you and your dad may not both like football. You and your dad may not both like golf. You and your dad may not both like gardening. Mm -hmm. But at some point, sacrifice is going to have to happen in order for healthy relationships to flourish. You know, parents, if if your kids like to build things with Legos and you just think that's a tremendous waste of time, 
you know what? Maybe there's time in your day that you could sacrifice to get in the floor with them and build some stuff with Legos. Yeah, that's a good example. I will tell you, um, for her birthday, my daughter, she's my <laughs> oldest, she just got a dollhouse. and uh, It's a big dollhouse. It's bigger than she is. It, it is massive. It's bigger than she is, and she's in the 90th percentile in height for a four-year-old. And He says that like he's proud of how tall she is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. I hate the thing. Yeah. I hate playing doll. Yeah. Loathe it. And now my son's like all into it too. And I'm like, dude, we were like, we were there. You yeah. were kicking the ball good. You were throwing the ball good. Now you won't even pick up the ball because you want to play with the tall house. <laughs> <laughs> That's not totally true. It's an over exaggeration. But I hate playing dolls. Yeah. But you know what I love? Spending time with your kids. Well, not just that, but. I love hearing my daughter laugh. Mm -hmm. She, this is a bit weird, but she has this thing where she takes the men in the family, like the little dollhouse family, and she makes them sit <laughs> on the toilet forever. And then, so she'll put a man on the toilet and then she'll run and get another one, put it in another part of the house and go, Hey, whichever one of them is on the toilet, how much longer are you going to be? <laughs> I've what? So this is an example of what she sees is the men in her family. All three of the the main men in her life. Oh yeah. Um, they spend a lot of time on the toilet. <laughs> oh yeah. All three of us. When it's just like you know, you've seen those yeah. TikToks where you know it's like how long it takes my husband to take a shower, five yeah. minutes, you know, whatever, and then poop. It's like going around and around. This can't be unique to our family. Yeah. This has got to be a thing. But yeah. With that, all humor is based on element of truth. Yeah. I laugh at that, <laughs> and she laughs at it because I laugh at it, and we both laugh at it. Yeah. Because it's partially true. Yeah. So, no, I hate playing dolls. No. But I love hearing her laugh. I love spending time with her. And so, for me, that's the sacrifice. Yeah. Now, I will say, she also sacrifices for me. Because I have, so as you know, listeners, I have wiffle ball, or like I love golf, and I have wiffle ball golf balls that I hit, like I just chip them around the house in different places. And so... Lots of times, like, we'll have been playing for a long time, and she she already knows it. She'll go, Daddy, can I play golf with you? Mm. And it's like, I know she doesn't actually, because all she does is shag balls. <laughs> she's just, As I hit them, or she might stand in one spot and go, Daddy, hit it over me, you know, like flop mm -hmm. shots, whatever. But, like, she can't be just totally enjoying that. Yeah. But yet, if I've invested in her... She comes back at four years old and invests back in me. Yeah. That's the beauty of letting the gospel dictate the family unit rather than the prescriptive household codes right. that are recorded in the New Testament. So, listeners, ask yourself this question. If Jesus sacrificed for you, why shouldn't you sacrifice for your family?